How are you? My name is John Stephen Gurney, and I am the author of about five books, and I'm the illustrator of about 150 books. No, not 100. Yeah, maybe 150. That's not my county. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, the books I wrote and also the books that I illustrated. So um, let me go in the screen share and see if I can find my PowerPoint presentation. Okay, very good. Uh, great, okay, so I'm gonna start off. This is a drawing I made when I was in probably fourth grade. And I was one of those kids who was drawing all the time. That's me with my little sister and my little brother. And here's a picture I did of my dog. And here's a picture of my little brother playing with our dog. And here's another picture of my little sister. And here's one more picture of my little sister. Now, at this point, you might start to get the impression that I was a mean older brother. I promise I wasn't mean. I just like drawing funny pictures. And, you know, she pretended she was mad when she saw that, but she really, she thought it was funny. So I thought if I like drawing funny pictures, maybe I should be a cartoonist. But when I was in fifth grade, I took an illustration class. And I would go to Mrs. Burford's house after school on Fridays. And that's me right there. And she'd read stories to us. And we would all do illustrations based on the stories that she was reading. So here's one of my illustrations from fifth grade. This is the Big Bear of Arkansas. And I don't remember anything about the story, except the fact that there's a big bear and it lives in Arkansas. But I like the idea of using a picture to tell a story instead of using a picture just to try to be funny. So I kept making more illustrations and I kept reading and then drawing illustrations of the things I was reading. And here's an illustration I made when I was in 11th grade. This is a Viking warrior riding on a pterodactyl, crashing into a sea monster. Now this isn't from any one book, but this was, this was inspired by the kind of books I like to read. And I was really excited about reading The Lord of the Rings. So I really like fantasy books. So they kind of really started inspiring the kind of pictures that I was drawing. And I liked a lot of science fiction. Here's a self-portrait I made when I was in 12th grade. This is a, it's me, but transformed into a robot. So my face is all metal, my hair is all wires. And I took a whole lot of different art classes. And then I went to art school in New York City to study illustration. So this is me as kind of a furry guinea pig. And when I was in college, I thought that when I graduated, I was just gonna do funny animal picture books. I thought that's what I was really gonna focus on. But as it turns out, I illustrate a lot of things that, that don't have animals in them. And sometimes I get to illustrate games. I don't know if anybody's ever played this game, but um, I like to say, guess who illustrated it? So this is my version of Guess Who. There's a couple versions out there, but this is one that I illustrated. And what's fun about this version is I was watching Toy Story 2 a couple years ago, and I noticed something on the shelves in the background. There's some, uh, some board games, and there's my version of Guess Who right there in the movie. A little bit later, we get to see it right here. So I can say that me and Buzz and Woody are the stars of the film, so that, that feels kind of cool. Now, I do a lot of book covers. And whenever I do a book cover illustration, I always think there's a couple things the book cover needs to do. It needs to let their um, reader know, is this gonna be a funny book or a serious book or a sad book or a scary book? So the style of illustration should let the reader know what the style of writing is gonna be like. I like to show the main characters in the cover, but there are a whole lot of great books out there that don't show the main character in the cover. I don't think the cover should give away too much. You don't wanna give away the ending of the story, but I personally think the most important thing a book cover can do is to make somebody curious. So they look at the book and they go, what's going on there? What's all about? What's down in that hole? What are they looking at? And if I can make somebody really, really curious, then they're gonna wanna read the book because they wanna find out what's going on in the cover. So in a way, that's the job of the book cover is to get people interested in what's inside the book. Now, this is the first book that I wrote and illustrated. It's a picture book called Dinosaur Train. And this was inspired by my son, Jesse. Now, right now, Jesse is 26 years old. He's bigger than me. He lives out in San Francisco. I live in Vermont. I don't know if I mentioned that to you, but I live in Vermont. He lives in San Francisco. And when he was little, he was the kind of kid who was crazy about two things. He was crazy about trains, and he was crazy about dinosaurs. And every morning he got up, he'd play with his Thomas the Tank Engine trains, and he'd you know, go to preschool. And before he spoke with anybody, he would get his uh, magic markers, and he would draw pictures of dinosaurs. So it got me thinking that if I could write a story that brings trains and dinosaurs together, it would be a pretty cool book. And this was you know, before the TV show Dinosaur Train existed. So here's how Dinosaur Train starts. 
Thursday was a day much like any other for Jesse. Trains and dinosaurs, dinosaurs and trains. And up to this point, it's a true story. And then just before bed, Jesse drew one last picture. And this picture is where he puts his two favorite things together. He puts dinosaurs on top of a train. So as soon as he does that, suddenly there's a loud noise and the whole house began to shake and this came in his window. All aboard, someone shouted. So the fun thing is the, the spikes there look like steps. So he walks up the steps, bleep, bleep, bleep. And the dinosaur says, please have your tickets ready. So Jesse doesn't have any tickets, but he has a drawing. So he uses his drawing as a ticket to ride in the train. Thank you, said the conductor, dining cars to the rear. So now he goes to the dining car. And one thing you might notice about this book is that the words only tell you a little bit. The pictures show you a whole lot more than the words tell you. And I'm hoping that when children read the book, they're gonna take the time to look at the picture and they're gonna notice things. And they'll notice things that the words don't tell them about. So in this scene right here, these words show you what this dinosaur is saying. Let me show you the view from the sky windows. But there aren't any words that show you what's going on over here, but I'm hoping that kids will take the time to look at the pictures and notice things, and they'll notice that there's a, a, dinosaur, a meat eater eating a hamburger and a plant eater eating a salad. And there's a plant eater who's nervous because she's next to a meat eater. Anyway, we go, to the dinosaur, we go over to the sky windows, and Jesse's riding along with the other dinosaurs, and it's not too smart because they're coming up on a tunnel. So tunnel ahead, Jesse yelled, duck! And when they came out of the tunnel, Jesse said, look, that's amazing. So he's pointing at something, and we don't know what he's pointing at. So hopefully that makes us curious. And we turn the page, and it's a volcano. And everyone leans over to see. And what do you think might happen when you have a train full of dinosaurs, and they're all leaning over the same way? Boom, it tips over. Uh-oh. Now, I'd like to use this illustration <coughs> to talk about body language. Because you can tell by the dinosaur's body language that they don't know what to do. This guy's going like, oh, I don't know what to do. This guy's like, oh, I'm going to miss my supper. But Jesse's right up here. He's looking at everything. He's going to figure out a plan. He knows the Triceratops has these two crowbars. So he gets him to jack it up. Come on, you can do it. Then he's going to get Mr. Bumperhead over here with his big head to go, boom, and push it back on track. And as a reward for that, thanks, son, you can ride up here with me. He gets to ride up front with T-Rex. Next stop, Jesse's room. There's Jesse right there in the window. Now, I knew that I couldn't have a dinosaur book if I didn't have T-Rex in it somewhere. But I didn't want him to go around and eat everybody else in the book because I thought, boy, that's going to be a, a sad book. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to put him in the front of the train. He can eat the smoke from the smokestack. That's going to keep his belly full so he's not going to bother anybody. Did you ever drink your milk really fast and then you laughed and milk came out of your nose? That's what's happening. He's eating the smoke so fast it's coming out of his nose. And there's the end of the book. Off to Jesse's room. Now, when I first wrote it, I actually had a different ending. I had a pterodactyl of Jesse ride home, and the pterodactyl put him back into his bedroom window. The reason this ending is in the book is because when an author gets a book published, an author has a boss at the book company, and the boss is called the editor. So the editor had some changes he wanted me to make to the story, and um, there wasn't room for everything. So this was my original ending, but there wasn't room for it when we. Um, when I added some things that the editor wanted me to add. Now here's the second book that I wrote and illustrated. This is a graphic novel called Fuzzy Baseball, and it's about two teams. One team is called the Fernwood Valley Fuzzies, and these are the good guys in the story. They're a good bunch of players. They, you know, they're, they're really talented. But the problem is that they always lose to these guys, the Rocky Ridge Red Claws. These players, they're really good too, but they're not very nice. And the story is also about Blossom Honey Possum. And she's the world's biggest Fernwood Valley fuzzy fan. She's always cheering, cheering for him. She wants him to win. And she gets tired of watching him lose to the Red Claws. And she decides, you know, instead of complaining about it, I'm going to learn how to play baseball. I'm going to get really good. I'm going to make the team. And the story takes place during her first day in the team. So there she is showing up. And the story also has an announcer. His name is Izzy Lazardo. And he gets very emotional when he, whenever he describes all the action of the game. So the game's about to start. There's a big crowd. Everyone's very excited. And the Fuzzies start out doing pretty good. Their pitcher is Sandy Koufax, and he's doing a great job. He manages to strike out everybody on the Red Claws except for one guy. And the one guy that he can't strike out is Reggie Rhino. And Reggie Rhino hits a home run every time he's up. So during nine innings, he's up three times. He hits three home runs, 
And the pitcher for the Red Claws is Gator Gibson, and he's doing a great job, so the Fuzzies don't have any runs. Now it's the bottom of the ninth inning, and the Red Claws are winning three to nothing. And it's not so bad that they're winning. They're also really making fun of the Fuzzies. They're being really bad sports. So Blossom is not really surprised by this because she knows, you know, these guys have this kind of reputation, but she's a little bit surprised at how the Fuzzies are acting. So there she is. She's in the dugout with them for the first time. And they're kind of mopey. It's like they're not even trying anymore. And she gets really frustrated. And she's like, come on, you guys, don't give up. The game isn't over. And Pepe Perito says, estas loca? That's Spanish. That means, are you crazy? You know, the pitcher's too good. We don't know where to swing. There's nothing we can do about it. But Blossom says, you know, I've been paying attention, and I noticed that every time he moves his tail one way, he throws one kind of a pitch, moves his tail a different way, he throws a different kind of a pitch. So if you pay attention to his tail, then you can tell where the pitch is coming, and you know where to swing. And Pepe's like, okay, I'll give it a try. Pepe is a really good player. He goes up to the plate. He watches the tail. He knows where to swing when the pitch comes, and crack! He gets a single. He gets on base. Everyone's excited. Next up is Pam Balam. She knocks it way deep into the outfield. And this guy catches it, so she's out, but Pepe is able to run the second base. So that's what we call a sacrifice fly. Next up is Jackie Rabbitson, and he bunts it. He makes it to first base, and Pepe runs the third base, who so runners at first base and third base. And Larry Boa is up, and Larry Boa hits it, and it goes up in the air, and it comes down over here. And this guy is trying to fancy catch behind his back. He drops it, he makes an error. So the bases are loaded. And Bo Grizzly's up. And Bo Grizzly's the big slugger in the team. He's kind of like, you know, like, like Big Poppy or Aaron Judge. You know, he's a big slugger. So everyone, everybody wants him to hit a grand slam. So the Red Claws, they take Gator Gibson out of the game, and they call the bullpen because they want to get Fernando del Toro to charge the mound. He's the relief pitcher. So now there's a matchup between the relief pitcher and the big slugger. And the first three pitches come. He doesn't swing. <laughs> but they're not strikes, they're balls. Next one comes right over the plate. He doesn't swing, so it's a strike. Three balls and one strike. Next one comes right over the plate. He takes a big swing and crack, he knocks it. He knocks it out of the park, but it's on the wrong side of the foul pole. So that means it's a foul ball, strike two. So now three balls and two strikes. Now Fernando's got to think about what kind of pitch he's going to throw. So he's thinking, oh, I know this bear. This bear, he is hungry for a big fat grand slam home run. This bear, he thinks Fernando's afraid to throw ball four and walk in a run. Fernando's not afraid of nothing. So he winds up, he throws the pitch, and uh, you have to read the book to find out what happens. But meanwhile, I wrote a sequel, Fuzzy Baseball 2, and in this one, I thought it would be fun if the Fuzzies played a team full of mysterious baseball ninjas. So here's one ninja, there's another mysterious ninja, another baseball ninja, another baseball ninja, another baseball ninja. So these guys are the opposing team in Ninja Baseball Blast, which is Fuzzy Baseball 2. And they, the Fuzzies always hear these mysterious stories about a mysterious team far away that has mysterious baseball knowledge. So this is kind of the legends they hear about. So they want to go play them, so they travel to Sashimi City, which is kind of like Japan, but you know, in the book we call it Sashimi City. And they meet players that have a very, very different style. That's the way this pitcher pitches. And at first they're really intimidated. They, they're like, oh, they're, 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 they're confused by everything. And then they try to, you know, Hammy right here, he's trying to play in their style. He doesn't do very good. But when the Fuzzies figure out just to play their own style and then not try to you know, copy the way their other guys are playing. They start doing better. So then the ninjas decide they're going to take out the morpho ball. And the crowd's all excited, morpho, morpho, morpho. And then the fuzzies look up to find out what the morpho ball does. And you got to read the book to find out what that is. Anyway, I just finished Fuzzy Baseball 3. And in this one, I thought it would be fun if they play a whole team full of robots. So they, these are the opposing team in Fuzzy Baseball 3, RBI Robots. So, you know, the robots, their life is very dull, just kind of doing mechanical work. And they decide they want to play baseball to have more fun, to have some joy. So at first, the Fuzzies are like, I don't know if it's fair for us to play robots. I'm like, oh, okay, we'll give it a try. And the robots say, we're, 
specially designed so they, they can't play better than the fuzzies, but they can play just as good. But Blossom's really afraid, she's scared, because her whole life she's had a fear of robots. So, you know, she kind of has to deal with her fear of robots. And it turns out the robots, are, they're pretty nice, they're, and they keep playing, the game goes on, and the robots are not allowed to recharge during the game. They, they, you know, they can't plug in the recharge. So as soon as they start running out of power, they put in, they put in replacements. So this is the ninth inning, we go to extra innings. Here it is, the 18th inning, everyone's getting tired but they keep going, 23rd inning, 26th inning. And here, you know, the, when the robots run out of power, they put in a replacement. And the fuzzies keep playing as long as they can, 27th inning, 28th inning, the ump falls asleep. 29th inning, the groundskeeper comes in to pitch. The game goes on and on, seems like it's going on forever. It's the 31st inning and only the nighttime animals are awake. And now it's the 38th inning. And Blossom finally is gonna go in. She was afraid to play, but now she's gonna try it. So she walks in, there's the catcher is out of power. The pitcher is winding up. He runs out of power just as he pitches it. It rolls close to Blossom, gets closer, closer. She hits it. It rolls to a stop by Axel Rod Regris. So she goes to first base and all the robots are out of power. So she's doing okay. But then the sun rises over Fuzzy Field, the morning has arrived, and as soon as the sunlight hits the robots, solar panels start popping up out of their heads and they start recharging. But they're not, they're not plugging in, but they are recharging. So Blossom has to kind of face her fear of robots. So you have to read the book to find out what happens there. So here's Dink, Josh, and Ruth Rose. And these are the main characters in a series of books I illustrated called The A to Z Mysteries. In every book, there's a different mystery you have to solve. The first one was called The Absent Author. The second one was The Bald Bandit. The third one was The Canary Caper. So the author, whose name is Ron Rory, has written a book for every letter of the alphabet, all the way to Zombie Zone. And they have them all over the world. They have them in Italy, except in Italy, they don't call them the A to Z mysteries. They call them the Piccoli Investigatore. That's Italian for the little investigators. And this one, they don't call the goose's gold. They call Il Mestero del Tesoro Sumerso. That's Italiano for the mystery of the sunken treasure. And if you read it in Italian, it's like, oh, Dincolini, mamma mia, somebody's stole my pizza. So here's one of the newer ones. This is Operation Orca, Super Edition number seven. Now you might notice that the illustration is done in a different style. That's because I didn't do it. When books are around for a long time, they put new packaging on, new covers. So they have someone else doing the covers now, but I still do the inside illustrations. And believe it or not, um, when I illustrate these books, even though the author wrote the book, I don't work with the author. I work with the editor at the book company. Remember before I mentioned that the editor was the author's boss? So the editor at the book company is the person I work with. And to do a cover of a book, I don't have to read the story, but to illustrate the inside, I actually have to read the story. Now this one, Operation Orca, takes place in Juneau, Alaska. So I have to do my research, find out where Juneau, Alaska is, see what it looks like to make the map at the beginning of the book. And this is always my favorite part in these books to do the map at the beginning of the story. So this shows you what Juneau, Alaska looks like and this shows you where Juneau is in relation to the rest of Alaska and there's the rest of the USA down there. Now in the story, the three kids go with Dink's father on a business trip to Alaska and they do some whale watching on some you know, whale watching boats and they find out that someone is trying to kidnap a baby orca to take it to a theme park. So I read the story and then, you know, the, the editor tells me what to illustrate. So chapter one, the kids are in the dock in Juno's with mountains in the distance. And what are the kids gonna wear? I have to read the story. The kids wore shorts, t-shirts and sandals. So there I make them dressed like they are in the story, put the mountains in the background. <clears throat> and here's a scene they go up and they see the whale watching boat they're gonna go on. So here's a description of the boat. Um, it's longer than a school bus, and there's an awning where people sit out of the sun. And then there's a sign on the dock that says, whale watching cruises, see orcas and humpbacks. And the captain comes up, and here's a description of the captain. He's a tall, uh, dark-skinned man with white plastic bags. He's got baggy shorts and long dreadlocks. Okay, so there's all the descriptions I need from the story. And then I need to know what shape the illustration has to fit. So here, the illustration fits the bottom of the pages like that. And then I start doing research. 
I wish they would fly me to Alaska <laughs> to take pictures, but since they don't do that, I use the internet to find pictures. And I'm looking at white watch, whale watching boats and all these different whale watching boats. And I really like this one the best, but you notice there's no awning on it. It's supposed to have an awning, but I'm just gonna invent the awning. And there's the finished illustration there. I put the sign on the dock, it says whale watching cruise. There's the awning, there's the captain with his groceries. And I get to do, I have to do some illustrations of orcas jumping out of the water. So I find these photographs here to make an illustration like that. There's a mama orca and a baby orca. Here's a whole family of orcas or a pod as they like to say. And here they are when they're capturing, or they're rescuing actually the, the baby orca that someone was trying to kidnap. So these four characters are Bradley, Brian, Nate, and Lucy. And they're the main characters in a series called the Calendar Mysteries. And they're the younger brothers and the younger cousin of Ding Josh and Ruth Rose. So the first book in the series was called The January Joker. And this is what the editor told me she wanted in the cover. Now remember, it is um, the editor I work with, not the author. So it's nighttime and the four kids are in the backyard looking at two aliens. The aliens look like broccoli. They're not really aliens, they're just puppets, but the kids don't know that. Okay, so I do this sketch first. And then I did this sketch second. So I, gave, I did two sketches because I wanted to give the editor a choice. And this one has the kids in the foreground, with the aliens back there. This one has the aliens in the foreground and the kids in the background. And the editor looked at both of those and she said, you know what? I don't like either of those. Do this instead. And the editor made a sketch for me like that. Draw the four kids down there, and the aliens up there. So I did that. And she looked at it and said, ah, you know, there's too many heads there. I don't like, the, try just one, two heads. So I did that and she said, oh, I don't like that either. Try just one head. So I did that and then I'm doing what she's telling me to do because she's my boss, but I'm not happy about it. I kind of think they're getting worse and worse and worse. And then I said, you know, can we start over again? Because we're going in the wrong direction. So the editors had a big meeting and they said, you know what? We're not going to show the aliens in the cover. Let's just show alien footprints in the snow. So they made that sketch, and then I made that sketch, and they liked it, and there's the final illustration. So here's another picture book that I wrote and illustrated. This is called The Bossy Pirate. And my inspiration for this book was a, um, based on a personality type. Um, I don't know if you ever know anyone like this, but the kind of a person who's got a lot of fun, a lot of creative ideas, but sometimes they get too bossy, and that's what Salty Jack's like. This is Salty Jack, and he's pretending that his bedroom is a pirate ship. You know, he's got the unicycle there he's using as a, as a steering wheel, and then his friends come over, and they tie ropes around the room. They hang up sheets and blankets, and they're pretending that they're actually on a pirate ship, and they're having so much fun that, you know, they actually feel like they're really on a pirate ship and feels like they're sailing in the ocean. They're having a great time, and then, you know, they get to... They pretend to see dolphins and pelicans and whales. So they're having a great time. And then Millie the mermaid swims up and she's like, Ahoy, Salty Jack. He's like, I'm the captain. And you have to go get us some fish sticks. And she's like, ah, You know, mermaids don't take orders. It doesn't go like that. You have to take orders from me. I'm the captain. So she's like, ah, I'm going to see you later. And it's not really his, it's not really a mermaid. It's really his, his big sister. And then his friend Bob comes up and is like, hey, can I steer the ship for a while? And he's like, only the captain steers the ship. You go swab the quarter deck. And he's, you know, yelling at his friends. And, he, you know, he's getting too bossy. And they were having fun. They were really having a good time. But now, you know, it's just not fun anymore. So they decide they're going to go home. And, you know, if you're ever playing with your friend, and if it's not fun, you can just go home. You know, you don't have to stay there if you're, if you're not being treated well. So he's alone. He's trying to have fun by himself. But, you know, it's just, it's just not the same. So that night when he's sleeping, he's thinking about how he was acting, and he decides that maybe the next day he's going to try to be a little bit different. So he decides the next day he's going to say yes to everybody's ideas. So he gets up in the morning, he sees his friend Barnacle Bob outside. He's like, "Ahoy, Bobby, come on board the ship!" And Bob's like, "Well, can I, you know, can I be steer the ship? Can I be captain?" And and, and Jack's like, "Sure, you get to be captain today." And, and Bob's like, "Scuttle up the flubber hoist." Then his friend Sanjay calls up and like, come on over, Sanjay. And Sanjay's like, well, can we use my treasure map today? He's like, sure, bring your treasure map over. And then uh, Nautical Norman's here. Can there be like a, a, a velociraptor guarding the treasure? And they're like, hey, good idea. So he's saying yes to everybody's ideas. 
and they have some fun stuff they do that they wouldn't have thought of. It, it was all just uh, it's all just Jack's idea. So they really have a fun time being uh, mean bossy pirates together. And um, here's our work. One of the good things about being an illustrator is I get to work at home, and I'm very neat and organized. I try to save that to share that to everyone. And I want to talk about the tools I use. So I use paintbrushes like that. I use uh, these is my easel here. And here's another thing I like to use. No, I don't use pigs. I use photographs. If I'm going to do an illustration of something, it's really, really, really useful to have a photograph to look at. So I have a photograph like this, and I use it as a tool to make an illustration like this. And here's the rest of the illustration right there. So if you're ever, you know, copying from photographs, I think it's a great way to learn is to copy from photographs. But sometimes people forget to use their imagination. So just because you're copying something doesn't mean you have to stop being creative. So, you know, I, I copied, you know, with a, I, I copied the way the fur looks, the way the folds in the ear are, the shine and the snout. But I also use my imagination to add the clothes and to add the hat and the watermelon. So I think that's a fun, I think I'll leave you with this scene and I'll stop the sharing. So um, I hope you had fun, a little, uh, little peek at part of my presentation that I, uh, that I like to do when I visit schools. Thanks, uh, take care, be well.